This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning and welcome church family and visitors. We are so happy that you've joined us. You know, time in God's presence is the absolute best use of our time. Eternal fruit flows from there. And the God of the universe longs to spend that time with you. You are so loved. We're so glad that you're joining us today. And let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the good that you're doing in our world. It's so easy to see all the bad stuff that's happening. And there's a lot of bad stuff, but there's so much more good. We're so grateful that today we woke up, Lord, that, we, that we're alive, that we're in your kingdom, that, that we have people in our lives who love us, that you love us, and that you are not done with us yet, that the best is yet to come. And I just proclaim that over everyone under the sound of my voice. Father, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn around to the person next to you and say, God loves you, and so do I. Hannah and I are so happy that you've joined us in worship today, and we hope that you found incredible hope and inspiration from this program. Several years ago, I began practicing the Creed of the Beloved by saying it aloud each day, and now it's become a vital part of the walk that I have with the Lord. Though simple, these words have changed me from the inside out and given me renewed vision, joy, and energy. Every week on Our Power, we recite the Creed, which says, I'm not what I do, I'm not what I have, I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it away from me. I don't have to worry, I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. And that's the truth, dear friend. By resting in the Lord's boundless and unconditional love, you will experience the fullness of his blessings. When you embrace your position as his beloved child, you will be empowered to step into your true identity, to be courageous, to take risks, and to follow his call on your life. Though it's not magic, practicing this creed changed the dial on my life one degree at a time. Well, I didn't notice like a huge difference at first, as I regularly trained and aligned my mind with the Word of God, I developed a deep sense of rootedness and contentment. And I believe this can happen to you too. As a daily reminder of who you are in Christ, we wanna send you this Creed of the Beloved bookmark. As you meditate on the truths it contains, we believe it has the potential to transform your life from the inside out. Write to Hour of Power, New Zealand, P.O. Box 26209, Epsom, Auckland, 1344. Or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website, hourofpower.org.nz. You can tap into the energy, power, and joy that comes from living in the kingdom of God when you walk every day in your identity as His beloved. As always, we're extremely grateful for your friendship and we're continually praying for you. God loves you and so do we. In preparation for the message, Psalm 118, 22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Brothers and sisters, may we work on the inner things in our lives and let God work on the outside stuff. Amen.
Adam Weber is an author and a pastor at Embrace Church in South Dakota. He is also the host of the Conversation podcast, which offers listeners the chance to sit down with people of all walks of life and hear their stories. His newest book, Love Has a Name, looks at how we can love everyone the way Jesus did, even those who are different or difficult. While recalling personal accounts of tough love in his own life, he connects them to biblical stories and illuminates the different and difficult people who Jesus showed love to. Please welcome Adam Weber. Adam, hi, welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. So great to see you. Uh, Huge honor to be with you and to be with your church family as well. The honor's mine. It's always fun to talk to other pastors too. We could probably commiserate <laughs> off, uh, you know, offset about various different things, but I'm so excited about your new book and so glad that you're joining us today. Well, welcome anyway. Um, for people who don't know much about your story, tell us a little bit about how you got started in ministry and kind of your journey to where you are now. Oh, so I, I'm kind of the most unlikely of people to be a pastor, and yet I think that's often who God uses. I grew up in the church, uh, born and raised South Dakotan, which is a part of the United States of America, if you don't know that about I've South Dakota. I've heard of it, yeah, I've heard of it. <laughs> but uh, I it's came to South Christ. South of North came, Dakota, right? That's, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, right. I, I always tell people we live in the South and the, the ocean frontage here in South Dakota is amazing. Yeah. But awesome. uh, no, um, no, I came to Christ later on in high school and had a really pivotal shift. I uh, always thought I'd pursue ministry uh, in the business field. So I went uh, to school for business and marketing. And the summer before my senior year of college, I ended up filling in for a pastor. And so decided to, I finished my business degree, went to seminary, uh, didn't want to start a new church, but I ended up starting a church when I was 24 years old. And uh, again, God just continues to do the most unlikely things for this Yahoo. I got four kids. <laughs> I've written a couple of books and um, thankful that God can use anybody. If you need proof of that, and I, I, I say this jokingly, but at the same time, really honestly, if you wonder if God can use you, uh, just, just think about this Yahoo. Just look at Adam uh, Weber, the I'm, Yahoo. Huh? I'm proof. I'm proof. I'm proof <laughs> God awesome. can use anybody. Well, you have this great book, Love Has a Name, and it really is a really good book. I, um, yeah. there, there are some books that are, this is a great book. And one of the things I really appreciate, it, appreciate about it is your message, which is really our theme for the, today, is how to love difficult people. I know sometimes we here at the church, we call them uh, EGRs, extra grace required, that, they, that there are people in your life, uh, family members that you love, uh, people at your church or your community or your school or wherever you are that you love, that, that you don't always have, know how to deal with them. Tell us a little bit about why you wrote this book and how you address that issue. Yeah, that's a great question. So I actually wrote this book really out of a place uh, in the first time in my life when I didn't want to love anybody. Uh, one of my strengths, I have very few, is the gift of just genuinely loving people. But a couple of years back, just went through a season where I didn't want to love anybody. I was kind of jaded. I wanted to love my, my family, a few close friends, and that's about it. And now I'm in the most life-giving season of my life, and yet the book comes out at a time when our world feels like I felt like two years ago. Yeah. And so our world right now just kind of wants to love, you know, their family, a few close friends, and that's about it. Uh, unfortunately for us, Jesus says that loving him and loving others is the most important thing. And so I began to look at the life of Jesus just to figure out, okay, for the first time in my life, I don't want to love anybody. How do I do that? And Jesus was so good at two, knowing two different things. First off, he was so good at knowing a person's name. Mm -hmm. And not just the names of the people that everyone wanted to know. He got to know the name of a person like Zacchaeus. Yeah. And so he knows a person's name and knows a person's story. And on, honestly, for us, it's easy to treat people inhumanely when we don't see them as humans. But something changes when we get to know their name. Yeah. We get to know their story. The person who thinks differently than us politically or around COVID, it's easy to treat them inhumanely when they're just like different than us. Yeah. But when we ask what their name is and we find out their story, all of a sudden we begin to realize we actually have a lot more in common than we'd ever imagine. And uh, Jesus was so good at that. How do we as Christians model when we have values that we care about? We, we have things that matter to us. Politics are important. Voting is important. But how do we fix this? Can we fix it? Yes. I, first off, I absolutely do agree. And just as you said, COVID has just made it even more so because now we're almost all behind screens. Yeah. And anytime we're behind screens, it's a lot easier to treat people inhumanely. Mm -hmm. So it's even more so right now. My, my, my challenge would be that person you disagree with, if at, all, if at all possible, maybe it's just like this, it's a Zoom call. Yeah. Get face to face with the person. Again, however you're able to, 
get face to face with the person and just ask questions. Hey, help me understand. Hey, would you share a part of your story? It's a lot easier just to throw mud and to throw rocks at each other. But again, Jesus was so good at coming close to the person. Absolutely. And, and just saying, hey, help me to understand. And again, even at the end of the day, you might agree to disagree. I feel like that's one of the old fashioned things that just yeah. disappeared. Yeah. Our ability. Can we disagree? It is that it's all, yeah. yeah. Like we think differently than this on this issue. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. But I, I think, again, for that person that you really are struggling with, if at all possible, sit down with them, buy them coffee, and just say, help me understand. And don't wait to re rebuke them and yeah, share yeah, yeah. your thoughts. Just genuinely listen to them and so, see what happens. And that's, that's actually practical advice. It's not just moral advice. I, I have yeah. realized as someone who I'm very combative, like my default is like, let me get out there and I'm gonna argue and I'm gonna win. <laughs> But I, I really learned that it's important to win people over. That we really want us to win people over, not win. And there's a difference between those two things. And the way you win, win people over, at the very least, is just humanize them. Like, like, listen to their story. Everybody has a reason for what they're saying. Everybody's hurting. Everybody's got some void they're feeling, filling. And, and that's what you're teaching people to do, really, right? I mean... Yeah, if we if we genuinely hope to change someone's uh, like thoughts and life or whatever, I've I've found that adults hate being told what to do. Yeah, Rare, true, rarely does American it work. Adults. Yeah. Yeah, rarely does it work to say you are yeah. wrong. Stop this. Yeah. But if we begin to model a life of Jesus and the fruits of the Spirit exude from us, you'll be blown away by the people who will come up to you and say, "Hey, Adam. Hey, Bobby. You're so different. Can you tell me?" why you're the way that you are. Mm -hmm. Or I know we disagree on politics and I'm just so curious. Can you tell me why? Mm -hmm. And you'll have a chance to share and to genuinely have a chance to truly change a person's perspective. Mm -hmm. And that shouldn't be the goal. The goal should just be to love the person and to bring them a little bit closer to Jesus. But when we model a life filled with the fruits of the spirit, people will be irresistibly drawn, not to us, but to the Jesus inside of us. And then they'll begin to say, hey, they'll ask us questions. Why do you think the way you do? Mm -hmm. And uh, cause I'm curious because you have something that I don't have that I want. Yeah. And uh, I think we'll be blown away. The people that I am always like, they'll never change. They're so <laughs> like, whatever yeah. are the people that time and time again, Jesus is like, you just watch, you just be faithful at them. And yeah. you consistently show me in your attitude, your actions, your words, and I'll do things you, that will blow you away. Amen. And that's what, that's what God's been doing in my life recently. Man, I love your book so much. The book is called Love Has a Name, Learning to Love the Different, the Difficult, and Everyone Else. Please get this book. It's written by Adam Weber, who is our, our guest and our pastor today. Adam, thank you so much. Any final thank words? You. What do you really want people to walk away with when they read this book? I, but I, at the last chapter is you because it's the names of different people that have loved me. The last chapter is you. I just want you to know that you are the one that God loves. You are the one that God delights in and he's crazy about you. He just longs to sit with you and be with you and have a relationship with you. Adam Weber, thank you. Love has a name. Get it. We appreciate you so much. God bless you, uh, sir. God bless you too.
Hannah and I are so happy that you've joined us in worship today, and we hope that you found incredible hope and inspiration from this program. Several years ago, I began practicing the Creed of the Beloved by saying it aloud each day, and now it's become a vital part of the walk that I have with the Lord. Though simple, these words have changed me from the inside out and given me renewed vision, joy, and energy. Every week on Our Power, we recite the Creed, which says, I'm not what I do, I'm not what I have, I'm not what people say about me, I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it away from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. And that's the truth, dear friend. By resting in the Lord's boundless and unconditional love, you will experience the fullness of his blessings. When you embrace your position as his beloved child, you will be empowered to step into your true identity, to be courageous, to take risks, and to follow his call on your life. Though it's not magic, practicing this creed changed the dial on my life one degree at a time. Well, I didn't notice like a huge difference at first, as I regularly trained and aligned my mind with the Word of God, I developed a deep sense of rootedness and contentment. And I believe this can happen to you too. As a daily reminder of who you are in Christ, we wanna send you this Creed of the Beloved bookmark. As you meditate on the truths it contains, we believe it has the potential to transform your life from the inside out. Write to Hour of Power New Zealand, P.O. Box 26209 Epsom, Auckland, 1344. Or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website, hourofpower.org.nz. You can tap into the energy, power, and joy that comes from living in the kingdom of God when you walk every day in your identity as His beloved. As always, we're extremely grateful for your friendship and we're continually praying for you. God loves you and so do we. Oh, the stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone of a whole new world. The stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone of a whole new world. The stone Suffer through the winter's cold, only to rise right up again and bear its seed a thousandfold. Oh, the stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone of a whole new world. The stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone.
For those of you who are watching, please stand where you are. Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving. We're going to say this creed together. Say it with me. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. Friend, today I want you to know that you don't have to be ashamed of wherever you are. And maybe you're not where you want to be in life. Join the club, especially with COVID. Many people have had major setbacks and they're embarrassed about where they are in their career or in their family or in their hobbies that they're wanting to pursue. And, and so they double down on the fakery. You don't have to do that. You'll have a joyful life when you're willing to bring your emptiness, your brokenness, your poverty, your addiction, your fears, all of these things, and just bring them innocently before the Lord and say, it's not because I haven't tried. It's not because I haven't given an effort. But Lord, would you help me with this? Watch, he'll help you. And he'll begin to chisel away. The series we're in is about how the symbolism of stone and working in the quarry is central in many parts of the Bible and how your life of discipleship is like the stone being pulled out of the quarry of Abraham and Sarah, that there is something really special and substantive about you, but that it requires work, effort, and even pain in times, enduring suffering in order that you can become the person that God has called you to be. Today, I want to talk specifically about the importance of focusing on the inner life before the outer life. Your outer life matters. Your job matters. Your, your choices matter. Your family matters. And your image actually matters, too. These are important things to you, and they're important to God. But they're secondary to what's truly going on in your inner life. That is your heart, your thoughts, what you focus on. And, and the things that you want to hide from others. Those are the things we need to bring before God and let him chisel away. I remember when Hannah and I, we were so lucky that we were able to go on a private tour of Israel with a guy named Ronnie Winter. He was the son of two Jewish German uh, husband and wife who fled Germany during, uh, during the Nazi reign and they fled to Israel. And he grew up in Israel. So he grew up speaking both German and Hebrew. And he was kind of this Indiana, he's still, he's still a great guy. He's this Indiana Jones type guy. He works for the university. He's an archeologist. He even has the Indiana Jones hat and everything. And it's just like a Jewish Indiana Jones. He's great. And he took us to this amazing ruin called Beit Shan. I think we have an image of it here. Beautiful, it was so fun. Hannah and I got to walk with him. And you can see the greatness of this former Roman city. Here are these pillars and colonnades and mosaics and roads and marketplaces and you could see where the theater was and the palace and it's all in ruins and he asked us this question that historians love to talk about and they always give a million reasons for it why did the roman empire fall why did the roman empire fall and he looked at us and he said bobby and hannah you want to know why the roman empire fell i'll show you and he took us to the ruins of one of the temples in this what used to be a major city and he said look at this these ruins look at the outside and he began to paint a picture huge pillars and this was gold leaf and here was marble and these great images and there would be torches and flames and these huge stairways and he's like and you could see it as he was painting this beautiful temple he's like oh, gorgeous beautiful and he's like walk with us and began walking sort of up the the ruins of the stairs into this room into this tiny little cubby it was like maybe like four or six feet around, you know, this tiny circumference with a little pedestal. And he said the idol for this God would have been this tall. So the temple on the outside was ornate and gorgeous and beautiful. But when you went inside the temple, it was small, shallow, boring. And he said this epitomized the Romans during this era. Everything on the outside is important. Everything on the outside is ornate and beautiful and rich and gorgeous. But when you get to the inside, it's hollow, boring, empty. That's not you. And he said this is the reason the empire fell. And I worry when I look at the modern world that time and again you see that as affluence and wealth comes, it's so easy 
to focus on the outside stuff, which again is important, but forget the inside stuff. Forget your relationship with your spouse or your kids or to forget the importance of your walk with God or to, to forget that these things on the inside are what really matter. They don't just matter to God. They're the things that really matter to you. And when you discover their importance, if you have, and I'm sure you have, but when you focus on those things in life, get better. It's interesting because um, when we reflect on Jesus' life, you know, Jesus, was, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And in fear for his life, he ran to Egypt. A lot of us don't know this son. He spent his time in Egypt as a child, but then when he moved back because of fear of the new Herod, they moved to the northern part of Israel called Galilee, and they lived in a very small village called Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was only about 300 people in Jesus' day, and they actually believed that the Messiah would come from their town. I think this is one reason why Mary went there, but another reason might be that they were only four miles away from the capital of uh, Galilee. Tradition says, we don't have any real historic evidence, but tradition says that this city, Sephoris, was the birthplace of Jesus' mother, Mary. And this city, Sephoris, was an unbelievable place. Unbelievable. Right at Jesus' day, it was being built by now Herod Antipas, and it was the capital, and it had palaces and streets and gymnasiums and theaters. And again, it was only a four-mile walk from Nazareth. Now, Jesus, we all know if you've been going to Shepherd's Grove for a while, Jesus wasn't necessarily a carpenter. The Bible says that Jesus was a tecton, tecton. That literally means a builder. Jesus was a builder. And and you can interpret that any way you do. If you're living in medieval Germany or medieval England, a builder is a carpenter. That's somebody who cuts down trees and builds houses out of wood. But if you live in Israel where there are very few trees and buildings are made of stone, a builder is typically going to be a stonemason. So it's likely that Jesus actually wasn't a carpenter. He probably could work with wood, had to know, you know the basics. But probably, historians believe, was actually a mason, a stonemason, not the not the lodge kind, the stonemason. You, know, you, you work with stones, you chisel them, you cut them, you sand them, and you make buildings out of them. And when you see the ruins in Israel, they're all made of stone and they're beautiful. And it was so interesting when we got to go to Sephoris to walk around and think, okay, this is four miles from Jesus' home, which only has 300 people in it. It's not a lot of work for Joseph and Jesus when he's a teenager in their little village. Most of the work that they would have gotten was probably going to be in Sephoris. We have no evidence to support this at all. This is totally conjecture. But I believe, and many historians believe, that a lot of these buildings in Sephoris were built by teenager or guy in his 20s, Jesus. Isn't that amazing that you walk around and, and it's very, very likely that Joseph and Jesus and his brothers worked on building this theater or worked on building these streets or these mosaics. And that most of Jesus' life you know, through his teens and his 20s, he was building things, carving things, and shaping things. And it wasn't until he was 30 that he became a great rabbi. Now, that is interesting to me because when you look at the nature of God, we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he got to cho effectively choose his job. And that he chose being a builder, a mason or a carpenter, that, that, that he chose this profession. And I think it is so important that we understand that there's something about God's nature that he loves to shape out of the gnarliness and, and dirtiness of the stone that comes out of the ground to shape something ornate, unique, and beautiful. And that's what he's doing in your life. Ornate, unique, and beautiful. That it's about the details. It's about the little things. And that's what God's doing in your life. They found another discovery in Jerusalem when they were looking at the stones at the, at the great temple they found that so many of the stones had ornate carvings on the outside beautiful images of things flowing and all of this stuff but the big surprise was when they dug up the foundation stones that is the stones that were under the earth the stones that after they placed them there nobody would see them that they still had the same ornate carving on them 
that the Jewish people who built the temple, the message is this, they believed so much in the hidden things that when they carved the stuff on these little stones, that even though no one would see them, they still wanted to give their all to God. This is the temple. And this is what the Lord wants from us, that the secret things, the hidden things in our life, are the important things. In other words, that we take responsibility for our lives. That we take responsibility for our lives. That we focus on us in terms of what needs to be fixed, not everything else. That we remember that the foundation is what matters. That what's hidden is what matters. Every single Sunday... For more than 60 years, a minister has gotten onto this pulpit and opened every worship service with the same words. You might know them. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Those are the same words as Havanagila, by the way. If if you're Jewish or you've grown up in, in a Jewish family or you have Jewish friends if you ever go to a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah or a wedding, you're going to hear, Hava nagila, hava nagila, hava nagila ve nishmaha. That is, that is word for word. This is the, that is, let us rejoice and be glad in it. And it's, both of those are pulling from Psalm 118. And, I've, and, and a lot of us have no idea that that is, when we say this is the day the Lord has made, that is only the second half of a verse. Let's bring it up. The full verse goes like this. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Did you catch that? So it's like builders were looking at a pile of stones and they picked the ones they thought were the best. And then there was this other stone over here and they threw it away. And somehow in the mix of it all, someone took that stone and said, yeah, it's a funky looking stone but this funky looking stone will be the most important one. It's going to be the cornerstone, which is the the foundational stone at the top of the ark that holds the whole building together. That it may not look like the other stones. It's utterly unique. It's got this bizarre shape, but this is the stone we need to hold up everything. That the one they threw away became the most important thing. And it says, So it's become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And then this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What day? The day that the things that were rejected, the things that were outside, became the most important things. The things that they thought were worthless became the best thing. The thing that's even, you might say, the cornerstone is often hidden. You don't see it is the most important thing. That although it was thrown away, this is what matters. And this is what matters in our deal. So why would you rejoice? Why is that, a, why is that something to celebrate? Why is that something to jump up and down and say Hava Nagila about? The answer is because it's a picture of the kingdom. See, the world looks at everything on the outside, all the vain stuff, but God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. The hidden thing that is happening today in your life is the fruit of your life tomorrow. You may have grief, you may have anger, you may have brokenheartedness, but if you give that empty brokenness to God and he repairs and heals and works on you on the inside, If that is fixed, but your outside isn't, don't worry. Tomorrow is going to be amazing. If the inside is worked on today, the outside will be fixed tomorrow. Jesus told us, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and everything else, everything else will be taken care of. Everything else, it says, will be given unto you. So in our world, let me just, let me just, Who's not worried about America? Who's not worried about this election? Who's not worried about the way in which there seems to be two groups that at least used to have some respect for that hate each other? Ongoing violence, 
broken systems and all the stuff that everybody's talking about. And yet it's not getting better. The more we talk about it, the worse it gets. What's up with that? May I suggest that Jesus' message of fixing the inside, the heart, before fixing the outside is the answer here. I remember when Hannah and I had the privilege to, I, I had the honor of being the youngest chaplain at the Chautauqua Institute, which is a, it was a, a mega honor, and I'm definitely bragging about it. And uh, I remember when we were there, there were a lot of things I liked and a lot of things I didn't like. One of the things that I thought was kind of cheesy was there were, there were these you know, people that would get together and they would pray for peace and they sang this song, let there be peace on earth and let it be. And I always thought it was, I, there's nothing wrong with it. I just thought it sounded like kumbaya, you know? And now, looking back, I miss those days when people used to sing songs like that. Let there be peace on earth. And the key line. And let it begin with me. Who's saying, let it begin with me? It's always, let it begin with him or her or this system or this law or this thing or that. Those things are important and they matter. But if peace isn't in me, I'm never going to experience peace out there. If peace isn't happening in my heart, I'm not going to experience peace on the It's a Small World ride. It doesn't matter where I am. I am going to be worried and anxious and something is always going to seem wrong with the world I live in. If I am not at peace, if I, I am not a loving person, it will be very hard for me to experience love and to only experience hate from others. If I am not taking responsibility for my life, it will be so easy to blame all of my lack and failure on other people or other systems or other, other groups. And Jesus looks at these things and he cares about them more than we do. But he understands that at the heart of it, we have to change. I have to change. If I want a peaceful world, I have to become a peaceful person. Let me give you an example. We can look at something, maybe the most disgusting evil thing in our world, and we can all point at it. I don't think there's anybody who wouldn't point at this and say it's not evil and disgusting. Sex trafficking. Very often, most cases, it's children who are sold into the sex industry uh, by gangs and such. Everyone will look at that and say, that is broken, that needs to be fixed, I care about that. I want that to end in our world. That is representative of hell breaking into our world, something so evil. You know, Jesus cares more about that than we do because Jesus not only says, put an end to that, right? Jesus says anybody who harms a child should have a millstone tongue around, tied around their neck and be thrown into the sea, <laughs> which I love, I love that. But he also says, and this is what's most important, that you have heard that it was said such and such and such, but I say, Lust, right? So Jesus says, lust is the problem. Now, don't get confused with lust and desire. Sexual desire is different than the word lust. The word lust means I want to objectify and use another person for my own pleasure and gratification. That is at the heart of sex trafficking. All of us, all of us can look and say genocide, the genocides that happened in the 20th century, or racism that, that pervaded so much of our history, especially in the 20th century. Everybody says that's horrible. But do you know Jesus cares more about genocide and racism than we do? Because Jesus says, uh, says anyone, you, you've heard anyone, you've heard that it was said anyone who murders, uh, let me read it to you. And you've heard that it said, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I say to you, anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, that's like filth, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Look, 
Jesus, we look at the outside, the racism, the genocide, the violence, but Jesus looks at the heart. Contempt! If you dehumanize people, if you, you hold bitterness in your heart towards a person, and yeah, you've never acted on it, you've never done anything, but you hold that in your heart, that's the issue. See, Jesus cares more about it than we do. We say it's all about not murdering, and of course you shouldn't murder. But Jesus says, stop chanting the stuff that you're chanting all the time. Stop going on social media and saying to real children of God the things that you say to them. When you go on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, if I have to read F you racist or F you libtard one more time, See, see, Jesus says, you want to get rid of racism, but you can't do that if you're saying F you racist. You want to get rid of, of things like autocracy, but you can't get rid of that if you're saying F you libtard. When you say words of contempt and when you cuss out people online or in real life or in an email, when you have contempt for another person, even if they're an evil person, you are making it worse, not better. And that's not who you are. You are a joyful, encouraging, loving person. It is so much more important to win people over than it is to win. And that is the thing that we learn from so many believers that came before us. From Mother Teresa to Dr. King. Hey, Dr. King? Look at Dr. King versus Malcolm X. Those guys didn't like each other and didn't agree with each other. And it was for one reason and one reason alone. One, Malcolm X, I believe, was okay with contempt and violence, and Dr. King was not. It was not okay to have contempt in your heart. It was not okay. Yes, you speak, you know, with what you believe, but it is not okay to, cu to cuss out and be violent and do all of the stuff. That is not what we believers do. We love our enemies. We love our competitors. We love people who disagree with us. And the more people ratchet it up, the more we have to have. Focus on our hearts and say, I will not allow bitterness and resentment and all of this stuff to be a part of me. I'm going to say what I believe, but I'm going to say it with respect. I'm going to do what I'm called to do, but I'm going to do it with dignity. I'm going to keep my chin up and be honest about what I believe, but I'm not going to say F you this or F you that or any of those things. That is, that is not helping. That makes things worse. Moreover, you cannot fix the world if you cannot make your own bed. You cannot fix the world if you cannot make your own bed. It is so important that we understand that if we can become the people who focus on little things in our own lives and can do that well, we're going to have more sympathy, grace, and wisdom when we become leaders. And that is who you are. you are. You are, God is asking you to take, if you have bitterness or unforgiveness in your heart, you probably have a good reason. You probably were treat, treated unfairly. You probably had some, some trauma or something horrible that was done to you. And God sees that. And, and I, I just want to say to you, be free of that. Give that to the Lord. Hand over your contempt and your bitterness. Allow him to teach you what it means to love people who who hate you or don't like you. Maybe you carry a lot of fear in your heart, fear for this country or fear for your job or fear for your family. It just cripples you. Of course you feel that way. I'm sure something happened in your life where you learned that I have to be afraid. I have to be protective. I have to be defensive or these things will happen. Give it to the Lord. Give it, trust it to him. None of these things you just do overnight. It's a process, but over time, begin as, you, as much as you can to give your fear over to the Lord. And he's going to give you peace. And the more peace you have in, in your heart, the more peace we're going to have in our nation, actually. And I guess that's what I'm saying. You want a peaceful nation? Become a peaceful person. You have a broken heart? Of course you have a broken heart. God sees what you went through. God hearts, God's heart breaks with yours as well. But allow God to come and mend those pieces together. Don't walk away from him. Don't give up on, on life or on your job. Tomorrow will be better than it was today. And the day after that will be better than that day. Your future is really bright. And you'll look back and say, I'm so glad 
that through this time I, I stuck it out with the people that loved me and with the Lord. Give your broken heart to God and he'll mend you together. And most of all, if you're riding the fence and, and you have not made a commitment to the Lord, commit your life to the Lord. Become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus says that anyone who loves the Lord with all their heart and all their soul and all their strength and those who love their neighbor as themselves, that they will have eternal life. And I believe that. If you entrust your life to Jesus Christ, to his work on the cross, you'll be saved. And make a decision today. Stop. Nobody wants to make a decision about anything. I, 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 I should end my sermon, but I, just this last thought. So often, at least I am very tempted when I'm invited to something to say maybe. You know, I don't know if I want to go. I'll see how I feel when I get there. And very often in life, this is how we are with really important things. Like, should I make a decision to follow the Lord? Make a decision today to follow Christ. We don't know how long we're going to live. And, we always, we, and I just believe that the best life that you can live is the one following the Lord. So make a commitment today. I want you to know I am so proud of you. I believe that God is going to bring peace in a broken world through you. I believe that God's going to relieve you of whatever anger and frustration and and all of these things that may be tearing you up inside, he's going to bring peace into your life. And I proclaim that over you. And I just believe that as we seek the inner things and allow the, the Son of God to work on our hearts, that we're going to become the kind of people, you're going to become the kind of person the world needs today. Not another person saying, F you, but someone who's saying, I'm blessing you. Let me, let me talk to you. Let me work with you. Let me be a friend to you. And I just believe that makes all the difference in the world. Father, we love you and we thank you so much that you've given us life and you've given us this country. Many who are watching in all, all sorts of other countries facing other political issues and other dynamics. Lord, help us in our nations and in our cultures that we love, our songs and our food and, and our families and all of these things that make up who we are as a people to never forget that you're the most important thing. And help us always to be gracious people, merciful people, quick to forgiveness, forgiveness as you are quick to forgive us. Quick to be people who have discussions and conversations rather than people who are always judging and putting down. We, we would never be that, Lord. And I pray that you bring healing to our nation and to all the nations that are listening online or on television. That you bring peace to, to our countries and help us to be ways in which that peace is coming. And Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.